Okay, is, if everybody's ready, we'll convene the meeting. Oh, as, as in this meeting, as in last, uh, Councilmember Brady will serve as the secretary, and Joe Nani will serve as recording, recording secretary. Mr. Nani will please call the roll. Um, Brady? Present. Connolly? Miller? Present. Greenspan? Present. And uh, Councilman Simon is not present. Uh, and Councilman Jones is a, a non-member that's present. That's it. What I'd like to do, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes from the last meeting. However, uh, I don't feel since we just received the minutes this morning that we've had ample time to review them. So what I'd like to do is suspend reading of the minutes and we'll incorporate those in our next meeting if that's amenable. Very, very good, thank you. What we'll continue on is the process, and, and I do want to finish this today, and I think uh, the process of identifying and concluding on the definitions for the ethics ordinance that we will, we will present. Um, I, I think last meeting we started developing a rhythm and we were moving through this, so this meeting we, we should be able to, to achieve our objective. Um, one thing, I just kind of an update, I did speak with the Ohio Ethics Commission, and they have agreed to review our ethics ordinance and actually have a full board approval um, on or before February 17th, which will put us just in, in the timeline for us to have it, its first reading before council. So the expectation is uh, it, that uh, we will have this, as I outlined the uh, agenda, or, or the timeline for this process. Um, we will have this before and presented to us at a work session on the 15th of February the ethics, Ohio Ethics Commission will look at it and get back to us on or after the 17th and uh, we'll note any exceptions at the first reading meeting which will be soon soon thereafter. I will, thank you. Regular work session. Oh, that's a regular. That's a regular work session date. Yeah. The expectation is to have it on the work session agenda on the fifteenth. If for some reason we don't have a work session on that date, the next available work session. I'm not calling a special work session agenda. Okay. Great. Um, getting back to the definitions and just concluding some issues we had asked uh, Councilmember Miller and uh, and our our attorney provide just some, some clarity on a few items. I'd like to wrap those up before we move forward. Um, one of the other things that you have in front of you in speaking with the Ohio Ethics Commission, they, they went through and gave us a, a uh, sheet of definitions or a couple pages of definitions so that we don't have to keep fumbling through this, um, the document to try to identify each section where there is a definition. So we'll, once we conclude this section, we'll move into the um, the definitions that they provided and then from there I would recommend that we work uh, we can depart from the Ohio ethics law and look at some definitions that were provided by the transition advisor group and the other document that we're working from insofar as creating a list of definitions and then the expectation from this is um, is uh, chief of staff Nani and I will sit down and uh, prepare a complete list of definitions as part of the compilation of minutes and when we meet again which I, I have scheduled a meeting um, for Tuesday in the program that I provided you but we can discuss that at that meeting is when we I would anticipate we start moving into actual policy and uh, and uh, procedure discussions and I'll put an agenda together specifically for that meeting and the subsequent meeting so that we can go through this in, in an expeditious but thorough manner so Councilmember Miller if you could why don't we go ahead and start with you you were to provide a definition um, for public public agency. Mr. Chairman, my colleagues, I was charged with uh, uh, drafting a definition of public agency that uh, 
that is county specific. The, uh, the one in the Ohio Revised Code referred to the state legislature and state boards and commissions and school boards and lots of other things. And, and the uh, uh, draft that I wrote is as follows. Uh, public agency means the county council, all count, Cuyahoga County courts, any department, division, institution, board, commission, authority, bureau, advisory council, or other administrative instrumentality of the county or any board commission or advisory council for which the Cuyahoga County Executive and or the Cuyahoga County Council appoints one or more of its members. Public agency does not include any department, division, institution, board, commission, authority, bureau, advisory council or other instrumentality that functioned exclusively for cultural, educational, historical, humanitarian, advisory, or research purposes that does not expend more than $10,000 per calendar year, excluding sal salaries and wages of employees and whose members are uncompensated. I would note that that second section simply uh, tracks word for word what the state law says and, and just uh, translates it to our own. The other question is, uh, is I know it's certainly a debatable question as to whether we can include anything for which we appoint one or more of its members. I, I think that's depending on how we use this, that that uh, it's going to be a question of whether we can or should do that, but for initial points of being inclusive, I, I included it in this draft. Mr. Miller, did you have courts in there? Could you just read that again? It I says, public agency mean, means the county council, all Cuyahoga County courts, dot, dot, dot. I don't think that you can include courts. I think you have a separation of powers uh, problem there. I don't think under the Constitution that you can, in, you can enforce these rules on the courts. It's a separate branch of government. Uh, May I ask Mr. Morales if he concurs? I do concur. I think the, the I Great, think great the, minds. <laughs> I think the addition of, uh, as soon as he read the definition, I started uh, thumbing through the charter to see if there was anything that could support the uh, uh, inclusion of the courts and at, th at this point I would I th I'd caution against it I think it needs to be uh, examined carefully yeah it, it's very basic the <coughs> constitutional uh, problem with uh, separation of powers we can't we can't do anything to the courts just like we can't change their budget or mr. mr. president uh, mr. chairman uh, basic as it is I would point out that that the state of Ohio is under the same uh, separation of powers re regime between the, uh, the, uh, the executive, the legislature, and the state courts, and, and, the, uh, and the language that I followed from the state code in drafting this includes all state courts in their definition, you know, so, uh, so I didn't do anything different at the local level than what was done in the state law at the state level. Yeah, Mr. It, it, it does. It does. Councilman Miller is correct. It does state in the in the state Ohio ethics law definition. It does refer to courts. I think we need to take a look at the issue, uh, and um, I can I can uh, I can research the matter. But uh, you know what? This might cover just like having the judges file that ethics form. That's the extent to which they push it. I, I think if you really push it, I don't think you can do it on the courts. If it's in there, let's leave it in there and let somebody else raise it. But Here, here's what, what I'm, I might what I would suggest after after the definitions are put together, I'm going <clears> to <throat> why don't I forward it to the chief legal counsel for the Ohio Ethics Commission, get, get have her take a look at it and then respond back. Um, she'll let us know if there if there are any conflicts with with anything. Obviously, she and I have had extensive conversations. If, if courts needs to be in there and we exclude it, she's going to recommend that we, that we put it back. So, um, Well, uh, with all due respect, sir, I, I, uh, gathering that opinion, I think, would be useful. I don't think it's dispositive. Uh, I think that the, the, uh, there are issues of interpreting the charter as well, uh, so that the law department and, indeed, the prosecutor, I think, would have a role in, uh, in examining the question. 
potentially. Can I ask this generic question then? If the council wants an opinion, then who do we seek it from? The prosecutor, the attorney general, the, the ethic commission? I mean, or you? I mean, who would be the official that you would? The charter calls for the director of law to be legal counsel to both the, the uh, council, the county council, and to the chief executive. So at that, this point, executive. you are our acting or Exactly right. Okay. Interim. You're saying that if we, just for sake of argument, we got an opinion from the attorney general, you're saying it would be just sort of ancillary? Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying that. I'm, I'm saying that uh, it's not necessarily dispositive. Ancillary. <laughs> so. Okay, well, let me. Just, um, just in terms of certainly the, in an opinion of the AG would be important if we were talking about the interpretation of a state statute. But to the extent that there are issues of uh, concerning the charter, uh, then those are issues that, that, uh, that, that we would uh, be involved in, uh, uh, in guiding you on. Very good. Then what, what, I, what I would recommend, uh, I would support Councilman Miller's definition with the word courts in there only to be consistent with the current state law, um, realizing that we may have possibly an enforcement issue down the road. But to, once again, for the sake of consistency, I would, <coughs> am I going against your advice or? No, I'm, I, I wouldn't say you're, I won't say that you're going against my, my advice. I would say that there, uh, there, there, there is an open question as to the reach of, of the charter, and that that at some point will have to be resolved, and it may be that that the courts will have an opinion uh, on on the question as well. So. Okay, well then let me let me do this. Then we we will go uh, gain consensus. We'll do it two ways, just like we did previously on the definition of immediate family. We'll, we'll take two votes, um, one, one with the inclusion. Well, let, let, me, let, me back, let me back up. Are we in agreement with the language as written with the only item outstanding being the inclusion of courts? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, you can, you're the chair and you can make this as formal as you want. I just want to say, since there are so few of us here, that uh, I'm, uh, I'm supporting the position of the chair on this issue, understanding that there, you know, the, the issue has some gray areas that that are probably going to continue to come up between, you know, state law and uh, and, the, and the new county charter uh, on a whole range of issues. Okay, Mr. Miller. I would just say that, like a lot of what we discussed. Uh, in our last meeting, I think I think it's going to partly depend on uh, on how and where the term public agency is uh, is actually used in our ethics code. It it, uh, it may it may turn out to be uh, be simply uh, just descriptive of where someone might interact with government, but not not actually find itself in critical sections. Uh, on the other hand, it may be more, more critical. And I think, I think it might partly depend on that. Okay, well, let me back off my original position then and, and just ask for consensus as, as Councilmember Miller read the, um, read the definition. Is there agree agreement that the, uh, is there consensus on this issue? Okay, hearing no opposition, then that'll, that shall be the definition. And um, Mr. Miller, if you can hand that down to Mr. Nani, he'll include it in the record. Thank you. Uh, there, there are four other items. Quickly, Mr. Morales, I know you, you sent us emails on these. Uh, the first one has to do with the definition of anything of value. Uh, there is a provision in the Ohio Revised Code uh, providing for a definition. It's 1.03 of the code. It's defined as uh, uh, anything of value includes, uh, it's, it's used in the section of the revised code for the, violation, for the violation of which there is provided a penalty or forfeiture unless the context otherwise, otherwise requires anything of value includes A, money, bank bills or notes, 
United States Treasury notes and other bills, bonds, or notes issued by lawful authority and intended to pass and circulate as money, semicolon, B, goods and chattels, C, promissory notes, bills of exchange, orders, drafts, warrants, checks, or bonds given for the payment of money, D, receipts given for the payment of money or other property, E, rights in action, F, things which uh, savor or uh, savor of the of the realty and and are at the time that they are taken a part of the freehold, uh, whether they are of the substance or produced thereof, uh, or fixed thereto. Although there may be no interval between the severing and taking away, I'm old property law. G, any interest in realty, including fee simple and partial interest, present and future, contingent or vested interest, beneficial interest, leasehold interest and any other interest in realty. H, any promise of future employment. I, every other thing of value. So it's pretty extensive. I, I kind of should have been A and that would have been it. Right. Anything me, of value. Let, let, me ask you, let me ask you this, Mr. Morales. The H, any promise of future employment. We have the right to expand that. If we were to expand that to say future or continued employment, you know, for example, if someone is about to lose their job and they, as an example, and they were to give something of value to retain their job, would it be prudent for us to, to expand that, that definition for continued employment? Well, that's a, that's a policy question that you'll have to you'll have to consider yourselves. But I can say that there is no reason that. Uh, that the, the, you couldn't do that if you wanted, right? So you're not bound by the language of the revised code on this, uh, either in the definitions generally or, or in the statute. You're, you're developing an ethics policy pursuant to the authority vested in you by the charter, and you have uh, flexibility to deviate from, from the code. Does anyone else have any, any additions or comments on this? I, I would like to add on H, I would like to, to accept the definition of anything of value as defined in 1.03 and add in H the words any promise of future and then add the words or continued employment. Any, any comments? Mr. Miller. I would just comment that, that what we're just discussing here is uh, is a definition of something of value, and so uh, so the uh, the promise of future employment would be uh, presumably something of value that's received in exchange for uh, some kind of government favor, which we're going to prohibit someplace else in in this section. So. Uh, uh, I'm pointing out that this is uh, this is uh, the thing received rather rather than the thing given, you know. But but your point probably still is uh, is appropriate. I, thank you. And I, I, I can think of an example as if a, a uh, contract or a um, instance might arise where a department is being eliminated and a favor is given based on a relationship for continued employment. You know, someone may know someone and says, hey, if we do this, we'll be able to keep our, keep our I, I just think there, there could be some instances, I'm not articulating it well enough, but I, I, would, I would like to urge that we, we add the words or continued if, if that's the, the consent of this board. I don't have a problem um, adding it, but I think it's what Mr. Miller was saying, it, it actually comes under um, something of value, promises of something of value, but I don't have a problem adding it. So. Okay. Chairman, I also have no opposition. Great, then we will read, then uh, Mr. Nani will include anything of value as defined in section 1.03 with the addition of or continued in section 8. Mr. Morales, there were there were two uh, three other definitions 
uh, employer. That was not one of them, was it? It was an uh, executive agency decision. <clears throat> yeah, now I have obtained this from the code. I'm not sure uh, how, how relevant you may deem it to be in the context of a county uh, ethics policy. But uh, my understanding was that uh, you were interested in knowing the contents of 121.60 executive agency lobbying definitions. And it's a pretty extensive uh, section. It's uh, three pages of, um, uh, of verbiage aimed uh, uh, primarily at, at lobbying a a activities. So uh, you, you don't have to read. You don't have to read the three pages today. Um, have my colleagues, have you had an opportunity? Did you receive this document to review it? No? no. Chairman? Would it be possible that the, um, uh, that the acting law director uh, at least just give us his, in his own words in a fairly brief way what, the, what is encompassed in the, in the three pages? What? Uh, again, it, uh, it it goes to the uh, it, it goes to the the issue of uh, individuals involved in lobbying activities. Uh, uh, and and defines various various activities. The uh, paragraph uh, C. It defines employer as a person who directly or indirectly engages as an executive agent lobbyist. Uh, and then later, uh, let's see. And then there's a definition of engage uh, and a definition of executive agency, uh, meaning the office of an elected executive official, a department created under section 121. Now, my, uh, my thought is that this is not going to be useful to you and that it would be better in this instance to deviate from the state statute and come up with a separate uh, definition of employer that would be more appropriate to, to your purpose. Well, yeah, this, this definition of employer pertains to the, the lobbyists themselves, not an employee of the county or an employer of the county. I, I believe that, and my recommendation would be, this obviously is state law, so it's already part of our ethics ordinance. Um, and as we go into, and Mr. Mill and I were discussing earlier, that one of the areas we're going to need to discuss will be lobbying activities, ethical act practices as it relates to lobbying activities. What I'd recommend is that we adopt this as is, and as we engage in the definitions and the, the policies of lobbying activities, we refer back to this at that time to make any modifications to it. Is there consent on, consensus on that? Okay, so we will go ahead and, and adopt um, the definitions for executive agency decision. I might also make the same recommendations for the, for the next two items for K and L, legislation and expenditure, unless Mr. Morales saw anything in those two definitions that would cause any alarm. I'm uh, looking for my material here, sir. I'm not sure that... Uh... One, once again, legislative lobbying definitions for legislation for K relates back to the same, is germane to the same previous comment. It relates to, legis to lobbying activity. So once again, I'd prefer the same consideration. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would say is that 101.70, uh, uh, again, to me, does not seem germane to your purposes in, in, in adopting this code, it seems. Uh, seems related to um, the broader purposes of the Ohio ethics law, but, but not so much germane to a, a county ethics policy. So uh, I think this is an, an instance as, as in the last uh, in which you're trying to mold uh, the Ohio statute to, to suit the, our local purpose and, and they're not the same. Okay. Well, thank you. I think when, when we do get down to the lobbyist legislation, lobbyist section of our ethics ordinance, this will become more pertinent. So, if um, and I'll make the same statement for, for expenditure, I would 
just make a motion that we, or just consensus that we adopt those two definitions as is, revisit them as we define our policy on lobbying. Yes. All right, now what, what we'll do now is, and, and I mentioned earlier that I received a definition uh, from the uh, Ohio Ethics Commission, a page on definition, definitions, and I'd like just to move that we discuss those and then we continue the process that we did in the past as far as referring back to the proposal from the Transition Advisor Group and the other uh, proposed legislation and compare the, um, the definitions just to see if there's anything we want to do to add to this. Um, once we go through this document, um, we will then move forward and just peruse the other definitions uh, in those two pre other documents, the proposed ethics ordinance and the, uh, the document that's sometimes referred to as the Greenspan document to uh, make sure or see if there's anything we wish to add to our, to our ordinance. Uh, I'll go ahead and I'll read uh, the first definition of public official or employee. Oh, I'm sorry, no, this is on this, this handout. Right there. Yeah, we're working off this, this page. I give Joanne. So we'll go ahead, public official or employee defined. Now these are definitions coming out of, out of uh, the Ohio Ethics Commission. Any person who is elected or appointed to an office or is an employee of a public agency, which we just, which we just defined. Public agency is the General Assembly. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'll read it. Is the, the General Assembly, all courts, any department, division, institution, board, commission, authority, bureau. Um, what, uh, let, let me stop here. Since we are defining our own definition of agency, slightly different, Mr. Morales, than what's in, what's in the, this code, we would then substitute our public agency definition in this section, correct? Uh, certainly, where okay. where you're we're adopting verbiage that refers to to a definition that you've adopted, the definition that you've adopted would. Okay, uh, I'll continue reading. Therefore, a public official or employee subject to Revised Code 102.03 is any person who is elected or appointed to or employed by a public agency, including but not limited to a state agency, county, city, township, school district, public library, or regional authority. The, the uh, restrictions apply regardless of whether the official or employee is serving in a position that is compensated or uncompensated, full or part-time, or temporary or permanent. There's a code section. They give an example. A public official and employee serving a county would, it would include but not limited to the county executive, members of the county council, other elected officials, all appointed officials, all members of county boards that exercise decision-making authority, such as boards of revision, regardless of whether the members are compensated and all employees, regardless of job duties, level of compensation, or level of authority. I believe what, what this, this example, I believe that the um, law director or, or the um, legal counsel for the Ohio Ethics Commission specifically wrote that for us, just to give us a, a sense of reference. So in this definition, the only thing we would change would be the, would be the uh, definition of public agency, which we just adopted, unless there are any other changes to this. Um, Mr. Chairman, just a, um, a point of some clarification, which may not um, may not be able to resolve, but um, I have some some interest in, and, and it partly was brought up by Councilman Miller's um, uh, discussion about the definition of a public agency as well. I'm assuming that this would apply to board members, for instance, of Metro Hospital, but there is uh, this this special, unique uh, status that Metro Hospital has, and uh, I was wondering if anyone uh, anyone has an opinion, including the, the acting law director, about whether board members of the Metro, a Metro Hospital fall into this. Are they, are they, um, do they fall into the purview of the county? Yes. They do. Well, the, it, is a, it is a board that is appointed in, by the county commissioners. And I suspect. Excuse me, by, had been appointed by the county commissioners. I suspect that they have to apply, they have to comply with the Ohio um, Ethics Commission. You have to file that form every year if you're on that board. I, I don't know that. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Is I mean, university area, trustees like have to, to do some, it, so. Some research into we. We have quite a stake in, in what they do, and you know, and, and in all honesty, Mr. Chairman, obviously there have been some issues raised uh, around this uh, very important institution, and 
you know, I'd like some 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 clarity um, about their status. Uh, uh. As the definition of public agency was drafted, uh, it, it would seem to me to, that uh, it captures that it was your intent to capture uh, the Metro Health Board. That's. That would be. I think that's one of the ramifications of the uh, as of the definition that you've adopted. So the question is whether or not a member of the Metro Board is a public official within this definition. Uh, right, and the only reason, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, to uh, my colleague, that I raise the issue is because I've heard sort of just discussion, uh, you know, and, and and talk about the autonomy. Of, of Metro um, and it's uh, and, the, and some suggestions that we don't have oversight um, over Metro and I know that that um, that's a, it's a it's a unique situation so I'm just in general trying to begin to define what that unique how unique that that um, institution is in terms of our ability to have oversight over it and therefore um, whether board members which I would assume I assume that they that they fall under you know these Ohio ethics laws, I assume this, um, but I just I'm looking for some some well, some Mr. clarity. Mr. Morales, do they the the Metro Health Board? They are they are under the provisions of the Ohio ethics law. Okay. Correct. They they are well they are they are in Ohio uh, they are a public entity. Okay. So. Um, I would have to review that the provisions of the Ohio ethics uh, law, but my my thinking would is that yes, that they are subject to the jurisdiction of the Ohio Ethics Commission. W with no, that, I'd be willing to bet that that they have yeah. to file that form. Yeah. W with that being said, how is it that we can modify, if we need to, this definition to encompass the Metro Health Board? I believe that's. Councilman Miller's, I uh, mean, um, Brady's well, concern, Mr. correct? Mr. Chairman, my, I guess my point is, I think we all assume, we're assuming something and, and we're probably correct. Could it, would it be possible for the, the, the law director to, to look into it to make sure that what we, what we think is the facts are, are, are the fact, is in fact the case, in which if it's not, we may need to look at, at enhancing, and if we have the authority to enhance. Mr. Morales, do you know if is the, County hospital created by virtue of a county ordinance. It's not created by a virtue of a state law, is it? Or it, is it? It is a creature of state statute. Okay. Yes, there is a separate. Uh, there are separate provisions in the revised code for the creation of a county hospital. So yes, there are separate authoriz uh, authorization provisions. I'll, I, you know, we're in a, in a fairly narrow area here, but it brings up a, a larger subject that I intend to be exploring as the chairman of the Health and Human Services Committee uh, down the road. What, I, I, sir, no, I, I think that that's one of the standing issues regarding the reach of the charter, right? Because a question arises, and I and I've seen it dealt, I've, I've seen it talked about, heard it rather talked about in context in the context of the executive's authority. But the, the question becomes, uh, to what extent does the charter impact on entities that are created through separate statutory um, authorizations like, like Metro Health? And uh, uh, the uh, uh, Board of MRDD, for, uh, for example. So uh, the, the opinion, the conversations I've had about it uh, deal with the issue of collective bargaining and to what extent the chief executive would, has the authority pursuant to the charter to engage in collective bargaining for entities like Metro Health because the charter says all all county entities. Um, on the other hand, there's a the issue was litigated in Summit County and uh, or rather there was an, an, uh, there was an opinion issued by the attorney uh, by the Ohio Attorney General on the issue in Summit County. And that opinion uh, reflects that uh, the, the executive authority would only extend to those, uh, those uh, entities that, that, uh, that do not have a separate statutory derivation. We get at section 603 or something that talks about um, the ability of council to um, 
deal with boards and commissions in terms of um, um, keeping them or, 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 or getting rid of them. And then it says comma, except by those created by uh, state statutes, which means we don't have any control over those that are created by state statute. Well, Mr. Chairman, it just it seems to me that this is obviously a, a, a big issue and uh, something that the executive um, is, is going to be um, uh, taking a look at, um, as well as the, as, the, as the council. We subsidize the Metro to the tune of, you know, uh, an inc 36 million, thank you, Councilman Miller, um, and um, we appoint board members. Uh, there have been problems. Uh, uh, employees uh, uh, of, of Metro are, you know, are, are county employees, or aren't they? Uh, and um, and so these are issues that, you know, I, I find this to be a, an interesting, um, uh, you know, um, unique status for such a large institution. I don't know what the, what the decision in Summit County was about, but I have a feeling it wasn't about something of the, on the scale of Metro Hospital, but I don't know what it was about, so. Mr. Bray, you know, when we, some of us went to, over to Metro Hospital, um, and they sort of gave us, you know, presentation during the campaign for candidates, but I'd like to see at one of our work sessions, have someone come in and give us an explanation as to their status and how they're created and the board members and all that. Mr. Chairman, to the council president, um, um, I would uh, like to talk to you about that because I would like to see that happen under the purview of the Health and Human Services uh, Committee, um, not exclusively, but um, maybe initially. Well, I, I appreciate that dialogue. Mr. Morales, the question very well may be, if I'm, if I'm understanding it correctly, is a, is, a count, is a county's employee to a board considered a public official or employee? Is that, is that fundamentally the question? Councilman Miller? I'm sorry, Brady, I, I apologize. I understand. It is a member of a board of trustees, uh, uh, like... Uh, Discussion started, a, yes. A, a public official. Okay. For example, a member of the board of trustees of, uh, of uh, the hospital system. Right? Because, because as I would read this, any person who is elected or appointed by any public agency, including but not limited to, State agencies, are we talking Metro Health, since it's under state statute, is, would be considered a state agency? Yes. Well, no, it's, it's a county hospital system. Okay. Created. Through state. Okay. Well, then we created move. Created by a state statute. We move over one word to the word county, would then be considered a public, um, uh, public official or employee. Mr. Chairman, I only raise the issue because of the discussion around Metro um, as a unique institution and also the tentativeness um, that the law director, the sort of 95% assurity that uh, the law director seemed to have around the initial question. Well, in regard to the initial question, I think this definition does encompass a, a member of, a, of uh, the board of trustees of, Good, fine. of a county hospital system. I, I, so. I would agree, and that's where I was trying to provide some clarity. I, I believe that is correct. We have, real quick, and, and it's at the discretion of the chair, Ms. Patterson was a member of the Ethics Transition Advisory Group, and did you, did you want to add something to this? University trustee, and I had to file one. Okay. Well, if well, if it, this really raises some interest, I'm sorry, Mr. Miller. Mr. Miller. 
Mr. Mr. Chairman, I think that uh, uh, Ms. Patterson's uh, overall point is on target, that, that, that there are areas of the ethics law that, that apply to people who would not be required to complete financial disclosure statements. Uh, but I would also add that, that, uh, that there are various other exceptions about who has to fill out those uh, forms. For example, the, uh, the legislature created a number of, of boards using the, uh, the money from the tobacco settlement, and, and, uh, and all the members of those boards were required by state law to fill out those disclosure forms. Okay, and thank you, Ms. Patterson, for that. And we will be addressing later in our policy setting um, sessions the um, can, uh, financial disclosure reports. And what we should do is look at look at what the current state law says, that who must file, and and maybe we expand from that to include our appointees to these various boards. Uh, so let, let me ask further then on on the definition of public official or employee. Are we in? in agreement that the definition provided by the State um, Ethics Commission would be one we would adopt, or are there any additions additions to it? Okay, hearing no comment, then I, I uh, request Mr. Nani record public official or employee as a definition. You have that document, don't you? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, moving on, anything of value we've since decided upon. Um, use of, I'll read the next one, use of or authorization of use of the authority or influence of one's office for, up, or employment. Uh, so I guess this would be the definition of use of or authorization of the use of. Voting on recommending, deliberating about, discussing, lobbying, or taking any other formal or informal action with the scope of a public, official, public officials or employees' public authority is use of or authorization of the use of the authority or influence of a public official or employee's office or employment. I, I must admit I'm unclear as to how this would be used in context. However, this is current state law, so we would be held accountable to it. Is there any? Pardon? Yeah, I, I would, as Anything Council else? President Conley said, just leave <clears throat> it. Is there anything anyone would like to add to it? No. Hearing none. Uh, sir? Yes. May, may I comment um, in, in regard to the definition of, of uh, public agency that, that you just I'm, I'm not understanding the, the, the intent or the effect of the votes you're taking uh, in, in terms of uh, the drafting of the policy and how you plan to go through this. But the other thing is there, there is language in, in, in this definition that, that obviously does not apply to a county. So I, and perhaps I didn't listen to it closely enough. I missed that. I mean, the extent oh. that you're... I, we're going, we're going to replace the definition of public, you're moving up to the public official or employee. Mm -hmm. We're going to replace the definition that's here with the local definition that Mr. Miller proposed. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So, so. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for the confusion. Okay, so moving on to, to the next definition as provided by the Ohio Ethics Commission person. Includes an individual corporation, business, tr business trust, estate trust, partnership, and association. Revised Code 1.59 also includes governmental agencies. Any, any uh, additions or comments on this item? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mr. Miller. I just can't let this go without making the comment that there is a, there is a, a real big national political discussion over whether a corporation should be considered a person you no know, but i but i don't think it affects what we're doing here so uh i'll just let it go with the comment thank you for your for your comment and any further discussion on this item for those who went to law school remember the slaughterhouse case that was where it said the corporate first case the united states supreme court said a corporation was an individual it had to do with some meat packing places in uh, new orleans numerous books have been written and nobody still understands it but okay very good uh, moving on to the next de definition 
Yes, there was consensus. Of such a character as to manifest a substantial and improper influence. A thing of value is of such a character to, as to manifest a substantial and improper influence on a public official or employee if it is of such quality, nature, or kind that it could be could have a substantial and improper influence on the public official or employee. The commission has explained that this is unnecessary, that the thing of value actually has a substantial and improper influence on an official or employee provided that it is of such a character that it is that it, it could have such a, such the influence. Once again, it's just, uh, I'm not aware of us modifying this in any way, strengthening it. If there are no further comments, we'll adopt this definition specifically into our ordinance. Well, actually, it continues on to the next page, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on to. The, uh, the next item is personally rendering services. Includes, but not limited to, representing, advising, preparing non-ministerial documents for or consulting with any person. Examples are negotiating or discussing matters with the agency personnel or contractors, preparing at an agency meeting or hearing, and preparing pleadings or documents to be filed with or submitted to an agency. A person would be personally, would be personally rendering services if he or she prepared or submit and submitted to a state agency, any grant or investment proposal, contract bid packages, responses to requests for proposal, or any other submission for financial support for a client or customer. Any discussion on this? Hearing none, we'll accept this, accept this definition. Chair, I'm gonna to have to be excused. I have a matter I have to attend to and I think I'm going to designate Mr. Jones in my place. So. Done. We'll be here till around 8, so if you... <laughs> <laughs> no, we will not. Um, the next definition is before. A matter is before a public agency when it is being considered by, decided by, or in the presence or under the control, under the official purview of the agency. Any discussion on this one? Hearing none, we will adopt that. Public official includes any elected or appointed officer or employee or agent of the state or a political subdivision, whether in a temporary or permanent capacity. The restriction applies to all individuals who are elected or appointed to or employed by any public agency, including but not limited to any state agency, county, city, township, school district, public library or regional and regional authority. The restriction applies regardless of whether a person is one, compensated or uncompensated, serving full or part-time, or serving in a temporary or permanent capacity. Any discussion on this one? I have a question. Classified or unclassified employees, does that need to be defined in this definition? Mr. Morales? Are you saying, does it, should it be included in the definition? Correct. Um, again, that's, that's a matter of, of, of your discretion. Um, if it was not in here, does it, is it, are we covered anyhow? And, and we're looking at the definition of public official, is that correct? Correct. Yeah, a, a public official would, not, would neither be classified or unclassified. Uh, a public official is, no, I'm sorry. So it, effectively it, the 8,000 employees it, who work for the it, county it, are public officials. It includes, by this definition, any elected or appointed officer or employee or agent of the state or any political subdivision. So yes, uh, this definition includes both. Okay, very good. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Miller. In other places there seems to be a distinction made between uh, a public official on the one hand that seems to be more restricted to the uh, to the elected kind of person and 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 an employee on the other hand that's uh, that's someone who's uh, 
appointed typically to do an administrative job. And, and uh, my question is whether uh, whether this is uh, going to create any confusion between uh, this very broad definition of public official as opposed to what we normally think of as an elected public official. That, that's a that's a valid point. Once again, this is state state law. I, I'm thinking if it would be prudent, maybe we have this definition in another document to break out elected official from public official, but I believe in the end, they're all going to be covered equally. Is that? Sir, I, I would tend to agree with Mr. Miller. Again, I think this is an a, a instance in, in which you are attempting to uh, draft a, a county ethics policy and attempting to uh, to uh, mold this mold it from a, a state statute and the and the purposes aren't aren't the same it, I think that for the uh, I think one of the consequences is going to be that the policy is going to be difficult to read and and to understand and I think that that this is uh, this will cause confusion. Uh, that, that's fine. Let me ask you th this question then. Ultimately, public officials and elected officials, s are we saying that there will be two standards, two ethical standards that uh, these two classifications would operate under? I'm asking, I guess, Mr. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, generally I would say no, but I think there would be uh, some some cases in our statute where uh, where for various descriptive purposes we would want to distinguish between the two. But but I don't think uh, I don't think we're going to have two sets of ethics policies. Mr. Brady, uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, um, not to this specificness of uh, uh, Councilman Miller's. Um, interest, but uh, in response to, or rather a question in response to the statements that the law director just made, um, which I think go to a broader question, um, uh, would the law director like to make, does the law director have some suggestions to this committee um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a broader sense uh, about the concern that you just uh, voiced about the approach um, uh, that this committee, uh, in your opinion, appears to be taking? I would reiterate that I, uh, I think that an ethics, in the, and this may be going beyond the pale of my, my position, and if so, forgive me, I, and I would apologize in advance. I, I think that uh, the, a statute or ordinance such as this that is going to be generally applicable to every employee in the county uh, needs to be readable uh, by every employee in the county. And I think that uh, uh, the approach of taking the ethics statute, the state ethics statute, and attempting to, uh, to just transform it in, into the county ordinance is, uh, is a difficult one. And, uh, and I, and I also think that the approach of attempting to, you know, to wordsmith it from the podium is, 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 is a difficult one and going to take a, 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 a long, an arduous effort. Uh, my suggestion in terms of approach would be to develop a, to try to develop a, a, a policy that is going to be an ordinance that is going to be is, you know, is going to meet your meet the needs of the county and the interests that you that the council legitimately has uh, in in uh, dealing with the the issue, uh, but in a way that will be uh, uh, that will be readable and understandable to to all employees, and and perhaps in a way that in in, in crafting it. Uh, uh, in, in a way that um, you know is different from the present approach in terms of uh, attempting to uh, uh, wordsmith it uh, in in this manner. I mean, I 
my suggestion would be that you develop a policy, individually confer about language dif difficulties or differences, and, uh, and then bring it to a vote. Again, forgive me if I've... No, no, no and, and that, will be, that will be the process we go through. However, and in speaking with the Ohio Ethics Commission, and obviously they're biased towards their opinion, Every word that's in here has me, as you know, I'm not an attorney, but I'm married to one. Every, every word in here has meaning, a specific meaning. If we wordsmith it with the specific intent of making it um, um, such that it, it can easily be interpreted, I have no issues with that. However, we first have to begin to build the framework in order to, to get there. And I don't want to water down, I don't want to remove words that will water down the meaning provided, making it so ambiguous that it, it provides conflict and then will open up, open up uh, too much interpretation. So I guess referring back to the original question with public official is that getting back to Mr. Miller's comment, if, if, if everyone, here, I'll kind of elaborate on my personal opinion. My personal opinion is anyone who represents a county in any fashion is a public official. Elected, appointed, employee, volunteer, you're representing the county, you're held accountable to this, to this ethics ordinance that we pass. And you know, we, we seem to have left out the words volunteer in here, um, although it does say permanent and temporary, whether compensated or not, so we can interpret that voluntary is, volunteers are included. But insofar as being a public official, if you represent the county in any way, you're a public official, in my opinion. And how we define it is something, it may be something different. I, I think this definition works, but I, but I want to know if we were to break it out to elected official and public official, what would the ultimate benefit be if they're almost identical in, in um, substance? Are you directing that to me? or? It was more of a, it wasn't so much rhetorical, but I was hoping to get some, I, I'm looking at Mr. Miller since he originally posed the question. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would be uh, amenable to, to accepting this definition uh, on, on uh, on a tentative basis, as we've been doing right along, and, and, and to find out if if down the road when we uh, draft the actual policy, whether there's a, there's a need to make make a further distinction. I think that would move us along. Okay, okay. I'm 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 amenable to that, Miss. I'm sorry, Miss Patterson. When Thank you for that, and, and I think we all understand, as, as Mr. Miller just mentioned, we are developing these definitions, but they're not yet etched in stone, and they won't be until the third reading in, in March. So, you know, we will have an opportunity as we go through the process to, if we see that a definition doesn't fit, we'll have an opportunity to modify it. Maybe we may even find that we're adding definitions as we go along, because we might not clearly understand um, today what the issues might be tomorrow. This purpose is to clearly develop the foundation. Okay, so if there, if there are no other comments on public official or additions, we're good. Everybody, okay, we're in, we're in agreement on that. Public, con public contract, a, a public contract is the purchase or acquisition of property or services by or for the use of any public agency specified, including the employment, uh, specifically including the employment of an individual by the state or any political subdivision or any agency or instrumentality of either. A public contract can be written or oral. The General Assembly amended the definition in, in uh, 1994 to specifically include employment. 
Any discussion on, on this definition? Mr. Miller. I would just uh, suggest tweaking it to make it county specific and, and, and say uh, specifically including the employment of an individual by the county or, uh, or any of its instrumentalities or something of that nature. Very good, Mr. Miller. Would you be would you be willing to help draft that and present it to Mr. Nani, and we'll just include it in the definitions? I have I have a question for Mr. Morales. Mm -hmm. the, the inclusion of or oral agreement can be somewhat concerning when you deal with contracts. Typically, as you know, contracts are drafted for two purposes: to outline the understanding of the relationship and to litigate. That's just been my my professional experience with that, not my personal experience. The, an oral agreement is very, leaves it very vague. Could we as a county, and this, this may be overreaching this body's authority, could we as a county require agreements only to be in writing? Uh, no. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure I understand why, why you would do that in the context of, of this policy. So I'm, I'm asking, am I overstepping I, my I, boundaries I, I, in this definition? I would definition? recommend against that okay. because if the, the, if the policy is going to regulate ethical behavior in the conduct of business, then you don't want someone to have an out by saying we didn't reduce it to writing, right? If there was some type of oral understanding regarding uh, a, a matter. Yeah, see, I, I was so, looking at it from the other perspective. I was saying if we put in the ethics ordinance that contract, you know, public contracts um, must follow these following procedures, or maybe it's more of a procedural issue, and if you violate that, um, and the evidence of that is a written contract. I, I think this definition is, is uh, included in, in this manner to suit the context of an, of an ethics uh, provision in trying to capture uh, all of the possibilities in which someone could be engaged in behavior that could be un unethical. Okay, so I, 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 was, I just asked the question. I, I have no, it, no issues with the definition other than to raise that one point. Mr. Miller. I'm starting to work with my colleague, Councilman Jones, on, uh, on, on a permanent contract and piece of legislation and uh, and it sounds like you've raised f fertile ground. We, we don't want to, we don't want the county entering into oral contracts. And so, so I think it very well may fit into that piece of legislation. So, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to second um, Mr. Miller's comments. It's, it's been my experience um, that we are on fertile ground. Yeah, so and, and I'm not disagreeing with that. All, all I'm saying is if, if, if council wants to adopt that kind of a procedure, that's fine. But, but that's in the context of actually in, engaging in county business, right? You, you're adopting and fulfilling your authority under the charter to establish procedures on, on, on how contracts are entered into. But that's different from the context in which this definition would be applied in an ethics ordinance. I, I was just trying to apply an ethical practice to an operational circumstance that might arise. If somebody, I, I, I can see a circumstance where someone is comes before the county and says, well, Mr. Smith entered into an oral agreement with me to perform these, these, this contract. We, we would be unable if the word or, oral agreement was, 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 um, included in the ethics ordinance to, to pursue action against Mr. Smith for a violation of the ethics if ethics If it weren't laws. included. In if it weren't included. Yes, I agree. Correct. So that's why I was, I was suggesting removing the word or oral agreement. No, I, I think that's counter to what you're intending to, to what you want to do. And you, you want to capture the possibility that there could be an ethics violation if someone should be engaged in some type of oral transaction inappropriately. That's Chairman, fine. My, and, and I just want to clarify, my comments were, were, were not directed toward 
what we're doing here today, but what Mr. Miller was discussing about his work with um, with, Mr. with Councilman Jones and in terms of his the responsibilities, other responsibilities that the council uh, has in their oversight. Yeah, yeah my, my only point was if somebody, entered, if, if we remove that and it says public contracts can only be written and someone comes before the county and says, I entered into an oral agreement with Mr. Smith, then if, it's, if contracts can only be oral from an ethics standpoint, not from a legal standpoint, then we would have grounds to seek an ethics complaint against that employee. If oral is included here, we will not have that ability to go after that employee well, well, for you, an ethics violation. You, well, you're not, you're not talking about an ethics violation, though. What, you, what you're talking about is a contracting violation. What you're suggesting is that you that the, the council may adapt, and Mr. Miller is suggesting the council may adapt uh, th uh, and recommend through Mr. Jones's uh, committee that uh, there would be a restriction on the ability to enter into an oral contract. And if someone then violated that restriction, that would not necessarily be an ethics violation. It would be a violation of your contracting restriction. The ethics violation would occur if someone used undue influence, right, inappropriately in, in entering into such an arrangement, which you want to capture. Uh, and you can imagine uh, you, you can imagine a variety of scenarios in which someone enters into uh, uh, what you may not be consider what you may not consider to be a a contract for the purchase of goods or, or, or services that the county normally would enter into, but you know uh, something to the extent of uh, you know an oral representation that something is going to be handled in a particular way. For example, it, it would not it would not be enforceable for the purposes of our of of of, of, the, of contracting procedures in the way that you're going to adopt them. Uh, but you know, it, it still could be captured within as an ethics violation. I, I hope I'm trying to be clear. I'm not sure if that distinction is clear. Yeah. Uh, yes, Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I would, uh, I'm in agreement with the, uh, the law director on this, and, and, uh, and I, would, I would foresee a situation in, in which uh, uh, some, some public official using this broader definition, some, some, uh, some, some director, uh, uh, Makes an makes an oral agreement to uh, to uh, uh, purchase something or sell something, and and uh, and and there's some some undue influence involved, and and uh, and some whistleblower raises an ethics violation, and then the uh, uh, the public official says, well. Uh, well, I'm innocent of this because there was there was never any written contract, right. you know. And and if we uh, if we say that for uh, for purposes of, of ethics policy that it, that a contract can be either oral or written, as long as it involves the uh, the, the purchase or sale of, of goods and services by the county, I think that's what we want to have in here. Uh, I, I I agree. I had a was thinking of it incorrectly. Okay, any, we'll move on from this point unless there are any other further, further discussion. Okay, so this, this definition, thank you for clearing that up. The next definition is authorizing and securing authorization. Authorizing of a contract includes voting on, signing, or taking any other action to award the contract. Employing the authorizing or influence of one's position to secure authorization of a contract includes a much broader range of activities such as recommending, deliberating, or discussing, and formally or informally lobbying any public official or employee about the contract. Any discussion on this one? Uh, this, real quick though, if we just previously defined public official to include the word employee, it, it's somewhat redundant. I'm not gonna recommend we change it, but it would, would it not be redundant? Since we included employee in the word public in the definition of public official, and actually the state does it as well. 
Okay. Any comment or discussion on this on this point? Hearing none. Member of family, we've already taken care of this one. Uh, business associate, moving on. A business associate includes any individuals, companies, or organizations with which the official is acting together to pursue a common business purpose. Examples of a public official's business associate includes, but are not limited to, the official's partners in partnership, co-owners of a business, outside employer, and co-members of an LLC. Any questions on this, this item? Okay, hearing none. Uh, interest, a prohibited interest in a public contract is a definite and direct interest that can be of either a financial or fiduciary nature. Mr. Miller. It's certainly clear when an, an interest is of a financial nature, but what does it mean to say that an interest is of a fiduciary nature? Uh, I'll give my definition. Mr. Morales may be able to provide a, an expanded definition. I would, I would assume in this definition of fiduciary, fiduciary nature, while broadly interpreted very well may be, as we were discussing earlier, with um, uh, public officials who serve in a fiduciary nature or capacity with the municipality or an organization would have a fiduciary responsibility or be fiduciary in nature. Is that, Mr. Morales, is that how you would interpret that? Someone who has financial obligations to well, another entity or to an entity? Uh, uh, fiduciary res uh, uh, interest would, would mean someone who has a, uh, a, a fiduciary responsibility to uh, an interest deriving from a, from the existence of a, of a fiduciary responsibility. So, uh, uh, you can imagine, for example, that uh, an individual uh, might be a public employee uh, who is also a member of, a, of the board of trustees of a nonprofit corporation. Uh, and and uh, if undue influence were used to uh, provide that nonprofit with uh, special treatment appropriately. That would be, uh, you know, the the benefit would not inure to the to the individual, uh, but it would be uh, in the nature of a fiduciary interest, in my opinion. So, m m might that include a member? Uh, I can be specific: a member of a of a school board has a fiduciary responsibility to that school board, but also works for the county in a capacity where they oversee contracts where a contract for that school board might be before them? That would be my opinion, yes. Okay. The thought that... Mr. Jones. The, came, the thought that came to my mind was, um, and I'll use a specific name, the uh, chair of the nonprofit of University Circle. Um, he ran for county council, Chris Ronane. Would that be an example? As he ran for county office, he also could, was over an could agency. I, could I speak to that? Uh, it gets a little bit. Um, um, the the uh, um, uh, first of all, I don't want to. I, I would prefer that the committee not uh, talk about individual candidates for uh, public office, particularly uh, in my district. Um, but uh, but beyond Sorry. that. <laughs> Beyond that, I believe that uh, that the Ohio Ethics Commission uh, uh, did look into this matter. I'm pretty certain they did, and um, uh, and they would actually set a percentage um, of uh, in, in in terms of uh, county funding of a nonprofit agency and the area that you sort of you're getting close that you're that you're speaking about. Um, there, there, it's actually even more complicated. There's actually a percentage. Of, of county funding uh, that for which if you go beyond, um, you know, you tip the balance in terms of what's considered, uh, uh, you know, um, not, um, not appropriate. Um, and, I, I, you know, I, so, I mean, I, um, I don't think it affects what we're discussing right now. But 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 there is a, a whole area that that you're that you're talking about that um, uh, that is not 
not clearly defined. There were, um, but it's, but I'm, I'm saying that it's even more complicated than that. That there's a, that, that it's not just a, you know amount of some money. It's amount of how much money and the percentage of money um, in a in a nonprofit uh, that the county might be involved in. And it's um, that's what they have the Ohio Ethics Commission for. <laughs> okay, Mr. Miller. I would just comment that there's a, there's a part in the opening ses section of the Greenspan draft that I really like where, where it says about that it's, that it's important to distinguish between uh, conflicts that are, uh, are incidental and, and occur from, from just being, uh, being a citizen in a free society and, and, uh, and other conflicts that are... Uh, are significant, substantial, and avoidable. And, and, and I think it's always important to make that distinction. And, and I think in terms of these uh, fiduciary conflicts, the, uh, the question that the Ethics Board was trying to deal with is, uh, is uh, when are the conflicts uh, small enough and infrequent enough that that the person can deal with it by simply uh, recusing themselves at the appropriate time, and and uh, and when are the uh, conflicts uh, large and pervasive enough that uh, that if you try to take that approach, you, you're just not going to be effect be be able to effectively do your duties in one or the other, and then you then you're getting into an irreparable conflict. Okay, thank you. I'm flattered you read that doc. I'm flattered you read that document. Okay, any uh, with the definition of interest, any objection to as as read? Hearing none, that shall be the definition. Uh, position of profit: A public official occupies a position of profit in the in the. Um, why can I not read that word? Prosecution. Thank you. Prosecution of a public contract when he, when he or she receives some financial gain or benefit that is definite, definitely and directly related to the carrying out and completion of a contract that he or she authorized or that was authorized by a board of which he or she is a member. Any discussion? Hearing none, that's in the record. Compensation, we've actually already covered compensation. Um, and I believe we adopted the definition for compensation that was listed in section 102.01, which is not as encompassing as this one. But interestingly, I believe it's covered in the definition. That the, the definition we adopted was compensation means money, things of value. And since we went since we've already talked about and adopted the definition of things of value, although I can't put my fingers on it right now. We just did that the, today. I believe that the definition that we adopted, since it includes anything of value, would cover the, the items contained in the definition provided by the Ohio Ethics Commission. So I don't believe we would need to reiterate that again. W what I would say, Mr. Nani, as we put these definitions together, and you and I can go through this together, when, when there's a definition within a definition, I'd like to refer to it in quotes and by the appropriate section within our definitions, meaning uh, number X or wherever it falls. All right, thank you. Mr. Chairman, you said this definition comes directly from the Ohio Revised Code? They, from the Ohio Ethics Commission. Ethics Commission. Well, what is the definition of tangible goods or chattels, or chattels in particular? Mr. Morales? Tangible goods or chattels. Uh, uh, a, a, a chattel... It, chattel is anything, really. Uh, yeah, you know what? I 
I, that my that goes. I haven't used the word chattel since I graduated from law school, so I'm going to have to uh, beg M off of that. Mr. Nani yeah. looked it up. Seth, it's a movable, movable property. Yeah. Yeah. I remember the word from my African American history class, so that was. A <laughs> okay. Uh, let, let's let's move on. The the other um, definitions that are included in the um, Ohio Ethics Law. Um, I believe when I spoke with the with the Ohio Ethics Commission, the document that we just went through, she believed would be the definitions that we would want to focus on as it relates to that law. Now what I'd like to do, is, and, and we'll be able to, to um, I believe, go through these quickly, is look at the two other documents that we have. One is the transition advisory groups uh, definitions, and then one in the, in the commonly referred to Greenspan document. Go through those definitions quickly just and uh, see if those are ones that I believe we should at least incorporate them today. As we go through the actual policy proce procedures of creating the, the, or the procedures of creating the policies, if there are definitions that we identify today that are, are irrelevant, we can strike them from the definitions list and we could add to them. This is merely to provide us with the fundamental definitions that we may need. Mr. Brady? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, seem, since you're at a point where you're ending up one um, process and beginning another. I wanted to ask uh, of your intentions today about w what you think um, the, the time factor is for what you have in mind. Um, not precisely, but... For, you know, for today? Yes. I, I, I would say we should be able to finish these within the next 30 minutes. So we, it's 2.30 now, I would say by 3 o'clock. It'll give Mr. Nani and I time to go through and prepare the definitions, get them ready for a meeting I would propose on Tuesday where we can actually start policy dis decisions and discussions. Okay. Thank you. Is that, is that amenable? Or were you just asking just a general inquiry? Okay. Th this fundamentally is a carryover session from, from Tuesday. I, well, I apo apologize, gentlemen. I, I need to excuse myself and have other uh, business I need to attend to. Okay. Today. All right. Thank you. Well, yes, Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I presume we're on page twelve of of the uh, of the transition document, which is their definition. Correct. Section. Okay. Well, we can. Well, well, we we can. Why don't we we can because we don't have quorum. Well, council members, president of council. Okay. Okay. Then we then we can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. What what I'd like to do here, and th this gets through the last what I keep referring to as a sausage making process of of creating this legislation. Why don't we take side by side, and we'll see where it's applicable and compare these definitions on page 12 and on page one, and just work through the uh, page one of the, the Greenspan document and come up with a, with a set of definitions, if that's amenable. Uh, do you have? Mr. Jones, do you have?
just go down the list. Uh, they're both in alphabetical order, so we'll see what's what's on one and what's not on the other, and we'll just go through these. Mr. Nani, do you have? Yeah. Okay. And Mr. Chairman, I just want to make sure I have everything. I have. do you have the Article Six definitions, general provisions. What is the second one? One. One. Yeah, they're right up front. We're, we're dealing. Okay, Are we, we'll proceed. The, uh, and, and now let me explain, these definitions are actually, would actually become very pertinent because we're gonna compare these, these two documents going forward. So I would recommend that, we, that, that all of the definitions in both of these, unless they conflict, that we adopt uh, into, into our record. So the definition first of administrative fee, is the civil penalty equivalent of a fine levied by and payable to the County Board of Ethics. Now, once again, these are specific to the ethics ordinance themselves. Obviously, administrative fee means something else to other bodies. Any discussion on this one? Mr. Miller. We're going to need to see whether we create an ethics board and whether we authorize them to, uh, to levy administrative fees. And if so, correct. then it's a good definition. Correct, that's correct. But where, where we stand today and what we're doing today, that, that's a valid point, because it very well may made payable to someone, uh, another entity, that's correct. Uh, looking, looking across advice, a written expert judgment and recommendation by the county uh, ethics officer as to whether an issue arises, uh, issue raised poses ethical problems and how the issue may be resolved. If the recipient acts in accordance with that advice he or she is in compliance with the code of ethics. The modification here, since since it appears, and, and I, I think it's appropriate, and I think we've come to some discussion on this, that we will not be enacting a county ethics officer, but that those functions will be absorbed by the uh, independent inspector general. If that, with that being the case, then I would 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 like to propose we accept this definition substituting the county ethics officer with the inspector with the independent inspector general or inspector general at this point uh, mr mr chairman uh, i'm not there uh, my my conception is is that the inspector general's role is is primarily investigatory in nature and that, and that the uh, that the the providing of opinion is is something that would more fall within the ethics board. You know, I think we need to, uh, uh, and and if we uh, if we if we create an ethics board, I mean the the, uh, the county exec, the county ethics officer is. Uh, is essentially the executive director of the ethics board. The, the ethics board is going to be uh, uh, a group of, of citizens who are not compensated and who have, uh, who come in on, on occasion for meetings but are not going to run the office on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, uh, and whether, whether we're going to, I mean, maybe we'll, uh, Come up with some kind of a hybrid in, in which the uh, in, in which the uh, the staff work for the ethics board is done in, in the inspector general's office, but I think we haven't made those decisions yet. Okay. And that's 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 fair. What then? What I would recommend is is that we we would adopt this definition as is, understanding that there are some philosophical decisions that will still need to be made. 
the definition itself, whether who gives the the advice or not, will still be in question. But the but the the definition itself would still hold. Is that fair? Okay, very good. Any other questions? Hearing none, we'll, we'll adopt that. Agency, I believe we're talking here about public agency, which we've already defined. So I don't believe that there's a, a need to re redefine that. Anything of value, we've already defined that. We'll get to gift, where it says see gift. We'll discuss that at the appropriate time. The um, Moving over to the uh, the other document, I guess we'll refer to it as the Greenspan document. The the definition that's on there that's not on the on the uh, tag document is the definition for associated. Associated means when used with reference to a business or an organization, including any business or organization in which a public servant or public servant's partner in interest is a director, officer, or trustee, or owns or controls directly or indirectly and severally or in the aggregate at least 5% of the outstanding equity of, of any business or organization in which public servant or a partner in interest has a personal interest. Now I believe, did we, did we adopt a definition for public servant or did we simply adopt the language for for a public official or employee. Yeah, Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, I think that, that the way you're using public servant in your draft is essentially the same way that public official is used in the other draft. Right, and that, that's what I was looking to make sure we're, so what the, the substitute in the definition of associated would be to replace public servant with public official or employee or employee, which is our definition that we adopted earlier today. Mr. Nani, do you see that? Sure, in the definition of associated, we would, re we would replace any reference to public servant with public official or employee. And I, I have this document in Word. So, um, one question. One, one, one minute, Mr. Miller. Ms. Patterson, do you know if this document is available in Word? Can, can you, would you please forward a copy? And that way it'll save us some, some time in, in transcribing. Do you? Okay, all right, great, thank you. Mr. Miller? Oh, I'm sorry. public official or employee, which is a definition we previously adopted. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, if I'm not mistaken, uh, public official as we previously defined it is, is, is broad enough to cover it all. Correct. The, the, no, the, the term public official or employee was only used in some of the commentary, but I, I think okay. that uh, I, I would, that I would agree. decision of our, our description of public official is very broad, and I don't think you need to tack on. Or on employee. employee. Yeah. Okay, very good. Mr. Nani, in, in our definition earlier today where we had public official or employee, let's just strike or employee since it's inclusive in the definition. Uh, mo moving along, uh, I'll just keep try to go in alphabetical order as best I can on the Greenspan document. Benefits mean, one, anything having monetary value in excess of $100. Two, anything regardless of its monetary value perceived or intended by either the one who offers offers it or the one to whom it is offered to be sufficient in value to influence a public servant in the performance or non-performance of an official action. Three, anything regardless of its monetary value, which under the circumstances a reasonably prudent person in the position of public servant to whom the thing is or may be offered would be recognized as being likely to be intended to influence the public servant in the performance or non-performance of the official action. Uh, the, it continues on the next page. The term benefit means, but is not limited to, a valuable act, advance, award, contract, compensation, contribution. It, it continues on. 
I think when we talk about the term benefit there, we might want to just replace it with anything of value. Would that, Mr. Miller, do you agree with that? Instead of listing it out in a term that may be inconsistent with, uh, with what we're trying to achieve. Mr. Chair Chairman, the thing that's different is, is that, uh, that anything of value does not have any dollar limit placed on it. We're, we're, uh, we're, I, I mean, uh, it it could be uh, it could be way under a hundred dollars. I mean, if it were uh, if it, if it were low enough to be uh, totally inconsequential, it might be excluded. But uh, that's where I think the difference lies in the two. Uh, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear. I I agree. What I, what I was referring to was on page two, where it says the term benefit includes but not limited to. I yeah. would maybe substitute all that yes. verbiage with anything of value. Okay, what, getting back to your original point on number one, anything of a monetary value in excess of $100, and I wish Mr. Morales was here, but I believe the Ohio um, um, Ethics Commission and the ORC refers to anything over $75. Um, if, if that's the case, then Ms. Patterson, do you? Oh. This was a big discussion point for both our committee and the campaign finance tag group mm -hmm. because there was interplay in the Ohio Ethics Code with that. And uh, I think you will find that both of those documents omit any reference to a, a dollar amount. And one of the points that came up that you might want to keep in mind is dollar amounts change over time and then you're left with a little, a very small provision that mm -hmm doesn't make sense anymore. But the, the whole thing about what is significant and insignificant, you're being so detailed about definitions, don't get into significant. Well, may, may, maybe the reference then here should be anything having a monetary value as, as referred to by the Ohio Ethics Commission. But that, again, I think has to do with their filing requirements, what kinds of things you have to report on their mm -hmm. form, not whether exactly whether it's a violation of an mm -hmm. ethics action. Mr. Miller? Uh, I think Ms. Patterson was making an important distinction. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, uh, in the public officials that have to file ethics reports, uh, you can uh, any gift that you receive that's worth less than $75, you don't have to report. If it's over $75, you have to report. Uh, if you, uh, in terms of, of how much uh, reimbursement for meals, you can, meals or lodging you can receive from a lobbyist, you can receive up to $100. Uh, I think not for lodging, I think just for meals and food and beverage, up to $100. You're allowed, Other, over $100 you're not allowed. But in contrast to these two provisions, in terms of, uh, uh, of how much something can be worth that you would receive that might, uh, might influence your official actions, there's no mo monetary limit on that. Anything that uh, anything that's that's perceived that it could, and to a reasonable person, or however that's worded, that when we we talked about that definition on undue influence, uh, it could be any dollar amount if it could influence your actions. So w what is it? I, 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 that's valuable. Thank you. Do we want do we want to state a, a monetary value? Dan, what we're doing, I'm oh, sorry, Councilman Brady, what we're doing right now is just comparing the definitions between the transition advisory group's definitions, which is on page 12, and then from the Greenspan document, page one. And we're just doing side-by-sides right now. Right now we're on, on the definition of benefit. Um, 
which, which is on one document, not on the other. The, do, how do we want to address, I, I guess I'm open for discussion. How do we want to address this, if at all? What are, what are your thoughts, Mr. Miller? My thought is that, that the term benefit is basically covering things that are in, in definition, such as things of anything of value that we've already uh, that, that we've already defined, okay. and, and so I'm not sure that that we need to. I, I'm not sure this is needed. In 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 benefits means, benef number one then. Uh, number two, anything regardless of its monetary value, these get into uh, anything regardless of its monetary value. Perceived or intended by either the one who offers it or the one this gets that leaves the, the value definition, but starts getting into a little bit more um, of you know will it provide an, an influence in the, the performance or non-performance of an official action? Whereas the definition of anything of interest just basically defines anything of value, defines a number of things, but doesn't necessarily present. And the, the definition of conflict. Mr. 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 Chairman, uh, looking at the uh, the words and terms from from Chapter 102, uh, first you have the definition of anything of value, and then you have the uh, the definition of of such a character as as to manifest a substantial and improper influence. And I know where it goes is that you cannot accept anything of value that's of such a character as to manifest a substantial and proper influence or improper influence. Paula, where, where are you? I, I, took, I took the state law document that you got from the Ohio Ethics Commission. And in that document, they had the definition of anything of value defined in, in 103, which, as you recall, was extremely broad and included almost everything without any dollar limit mentioned. And then at the bottom of the page, you had the definition of such a character as to manifest a substantial and proper influence. And, uh, and where where the code then goes with these definitions is to say that you cannot accept anything of value that's of such a character as to manifest a substantial and improper influence. So, so is your recommendation then that we just strike the word benefit because it's already covered during anything of value? Yeah, I think if we, uh, if we did otherwise, we might uh, weaken state law, which has no dollar limit on this kind of... Uh, this kind of characterization, characterization of influence. Uh, that, that's fine. I, I don't want to create more, more work or, more con or any confusion. So if, if there's no opposition, we'll just uh, remove the word benefit, or we won't consider it, I should say. The next definition actually is in both, both, uh, both documents, board. I'll read it from the from the TAG document, an abbreviation for any authority board commissioner special, special district to which county officials appoint at least one member or to which county funds are appropriated. Okay, th th I'm sorry, these are two different definitions for two totally different purposes. So the definition for board, and Mr. Brady, I believe this was kind of, this was going to your context with the uh, Metro Health Board. So this would be a board, a county board, external to the, the um, county council or county government. Is there any definition, any discussion on this definition of the word board? Mr. Nani? The, the question I have in just looking at this is that it talks about um, to which any county funds are appropriated. Um, I don't know if they're necessarily boards, but there's you know nonprofit organizations that have boards that are completely separate from the county that we would fund. Um, are you is your intent to encompass those or not? I would I would assume that's the intent of this of this definition. Okay. 
Be because then you, you may want to address another section where it just talks about agencies or entities that the county funds. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. if, if you're including that, you might want to include at all. Okay. Well, let's, let's make a note of that and see how the actual policies prevail. The other definition of board is the board of ethics. So what, what I'd recommend here is, is that we change from board to be board of ethics and established by the county, and we could say the county council, to operate under the provision of this ordinance unless the context clearly indicates otherwise, used generically by the term ethics board, may mean any voting body, and then it lists out more definitive terms. Now, we obviously this is a policy decision we need to make if we're going to even have an ethics board, but for the sake of this definition and where we are today, I would say we we adopt this to be consistent with, you know, our county, county you know, this was written a little differently when, when this was compiled, but at least gives us a, a place that if we go down the path of an ethics board, we have a definition in place. Are we in agreement with that? Okay. Mr. Jones? No opposition. Very good. Point of clarification. Are you saying that we're adopting the board uh, definition in the work group document and then we're changing the, in the Greenspan document, the board of board mean to change, to be changed to, uh, say Board of Ethics? Correct. Okay. Correct. Next definition would be business associate, and I believe we, that definition sounds familiar, didn't we? We covered that already. That was in the yes. Greenspan document. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, business associate was actually in the, in the definitions from the uh, Ohio Ethics Commission. Mm -hmm. That, that we've already adopted. So that, that definition has already been adopted. And it does not look like there is one in the Greenspan document. Un, under the Greenspan document uh, business, the definition of business. I don't believe that we've covered that definition yet. It's not listed in the Greenspan. Business means an, an activity association, commercial entity, corporation, enterprise, firm, franchise, holding company, joint stock company, organization, partnership, receiver, uh, receivership, self-employment, employed individual, sole proprietorship, trust, or other legal entity established to earn or otherwise obtain money, whether for profit or non-for-profit, excluding municipal corporations or governmental entities. Any discussion with this? Actually, as I look down, uh, uh, yeah, as I look down, there's more of this definition, correct? Is that where you're going, Mr. Miller? I believe that this definition continues down. Business with which a public servant, in this case a public official, is associated or associated business means a business in which any of the following apply, and then there are a number of stipulations regarding business interests. So I believe that we should, we should consider those um, everything from the word business means through number five. Any opposition or discussion? Mr. Miller. I'm on page two of Greenspan and I'm looking at item number four where it says The public servant probably should read public official. Correct. We'll, we'll make that well, general yeah. statement. The general or, or a partner in interest is a stockholder of publicly traded stock which is worth at least $5,000 or f at fair market value or which represents more than 5% equity interest. Uh, I just note that that seems to be different from, from the other definition and maybe it's different circumstances requiring something different but the other definition said 5% without saying anything about the 5,000. I, I would, and so where you're going with that is we should remove any reference to dollar amount, just leave the 5% for consistency and I would agree with that. Mr. Nani, do you, do you have that? 
Correct. We'll reward it just to be 5%. The uh, the next definition is going over the, to the tag document campaign contribution. Um, I, I just want to make a general note that that campaign contributions in the transition advisory group also encompass the transition advisory group's document also encompasses some campaign finance items, which very well may be covered under a different different heading, different topic. Um, do it wouldn't hurt for us to put it in in the definitions, but I just want to make that general statement. Could because at some point county council will have to adopt a campaign finance document, and I guess the question is, might this document, if it in, if it included it, be in conflict with that, Mr. Miller? Mr. Chairman, I I think. Even if in the ethics law we do absolutely nothing whatsoever with campaign finance, I think there's still a couple of instances where uh, where a campaign contribution is included in things of lists of things that might improperly influence somebody. Uh, I would uh, change this definition to read any monetary or non-monetary donation to the campaign committee of a person campaigning for county elected office. You know, the, uh, the contributions don't go directly to the person. I would agree, and I'm thinking about further expanding it pursuant to the transition advisor groups, expand a definition which we adopted to include or on the behalf of, remember we had that discussion, um, we might have somebody make a contribution. Well, maybe it does not apply. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. To, I guess to, to both uh, to both councilmen. Um, are, I have some uh, um, uncertainty about you know the very issue of you know whether if we're dealing with an ethics code or whether we're dealing with the campaign finance. Mm -hmm. um, Regulations, and it seems to me that these these things are crossing over. Maybe that's maybe that's uh, maybe that's just going to happen. But um, um, well, I, I feel some some sense of one one you know the borders being crossed uh, in terms of these two in terms of these two issues. Yeah, I, Mr. Braden, I believe not not to answer for Mr. Miller, but I think maybe the the context is if if the ethics the ethics code talks to campaign contributions as what might be a violation of an ethics law, at least the definition of a campaign contribution would be in here. But as far as the actual policies of a, a campaign finance document, you're right, maybe outside of the scope of an ethics ordinance. But I, am, I, am I correct, Mr. Miller, your original intent is that if we need to create an or, a, a policy regarding improper or what is proper improper campaign finance contributions, at least the definition's there. Yes, Mr. Chairman, my point is that that even if we don't deal with regulating campaign finance, there is going to need some to be some reference to uh, circumstances in which receiving campaign contributions would improperly influence uh, a, a public official's uh, way they handle their duties, and so that that's going to need to be in here. So we need to have a definition. I, I would agree with that. Mr. Nani, so so we know what we're going to just put. Do you have the definition? Can you? Can, no, the definition Mr. Miller modified, just modified. Okay, Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman to Mr. Nani, any monetary or non-monetary donation to the campaign committee of a person campaigning for county elected office. Any, any discussion on this? No? Okay, then that definition will we'll move in. Uh, move, just moving down, flipping over to the Greenspan document. Mr. Miller. 
along the lines of, of, uh, of what you had said previously about uh, when we talked about honorary and for, for the benefit of somebody else, you, you, you know, uh, uh, I'm thinking about a situation where, uh, where, where if somebody says, uh, well, if you make a contribution to my, uh, my buddy so-and-so who's running for state representative, not a, not a county office, then, then, uh, then I'll, I'll uh, grease this contract or whatever, you, you, you know. Uh, so maybe, maybe we want to uh, change it to read any monetary or non-monetary donation to the campaign committee of a person running for elected office and not say that it's specifically county elected office. It might be other things. Look, look I understand that point. Do we want to, uh, now thinking about this more, do we want to expand it to be, and to include PACs or party or, you know, party, you know, it could be a PAC or it could be a. This is exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about and I don't have a, Objection to to uh, what's being discussed. I, I'm just having now a sense of unclarity because it, it does seem that there is a, to me at least, um, a distinct difference between talking about campaign finance regulations, which I think is a proper discussion, and um, and where the and 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 putting together an ethics code for the council or for the county rather, and. Then when we, Mr. Chairman, to the to the committee, then to me, uh, you know, when we jump forward then and discuss um, people running for office is outside of uh, outside of county government. And now I'm additionally concerned about you know uh, how how you know how um, far. We have any authority to go, or would want to go, with with a, with, a, with, a, with, a, with an ethics code for county government. I'm just I, expressing myself. I, I believe, and and I and I respect that. I believe what Mr. Miller and I believe what what I and I join with him. I join him with this, and I see I, I I can see the wheels both the wheels are turning in our heads. Okay, why would this be in here, and and what would be what would be prudent to be defined? that we would define the definition of a campaign contribution. Taking the definition that we, we discussed last week or on Tuesday with the, um, up for the benefit of someone else. You, you may be influenced to make a decision. The campaign contribution may not be of your own, but may be towards another, another campaign. Might not be another individual's campaign, but it may be towards a party's general campaign activities, or it may be towards a specific interest group or, or um, interest item that may be on a ballot. And I guess that's where that's where I was going with it when I was trying to expand that definition to PAC. I, I guess my concern is that, at least from my point of view, that um, we're, we're, you know, we're these are we're getting into uh, areas that are I'm finding very difficult to define mm -hmm. um, in a way that um, can be. Um, know understood or interpreted um, but maybe which it's just because that's the stage we're at in the conversation maybe mr. Miller let me ask you this if we remove for elected office I'm, I'm unclear as where we are in the definition but just put a, a donation for a political campaign might that encompass whether it's an issue or whether it's an individual or or, or an entity mr. Mr. Chairman, I would recommend uh, any monetary or non-monetary donation to any political campaign committee. Okay, uh, um, uh, that, I'm, I'm amenable to that. Mr. Brady, do you have any? Do, do you, Mr. Chairman, to, Mr. to Councilman Miller, do you mean campaign contributions to candidates for, for offices other than county government? And and if you, oh, well, wait a second for that question. Uh, 
Mr. Chairman to uh, Council Member Brady. Uh, we're, we're in the process of constructing a section about improper influence. And I think if, if, uh, if someone is induced to make a campaign contribution in order to influence some county official's behavior, uh, I think it's, and, and, and if that has an improper influence, I think that's well within our purview. And I, I don't think it would even matter if, if the donation is outside of the state. Uh, if, if uh, I mean, it, it's clearly something of value. And so, uh, so for that reason, I think the broad definition is appropriate. Okay, I think I'm, I think I understand um, what you're saying now, I, I would just um, add that whenever this language is finalized, that um, people be able to understand what it is that, you, that Thank we're you. trying to do here. Right. Mr. Nani, do you have the definition? I'd like to read it just to make sure I got it correctly, but what we're doing is we're changing the definition of campaign contribution to any monetary or non-monetary donation to any political committee. Is that correct? Mr. Miller. Political campaign committee. Okay. All right. Thank you. The next definition, uh, there's another definition on the Greenspan document, candidate. It's at the bottom of page two. Candidate means any individual who is a candidate for an elective county office as defined in the county charter or an applicant for county employment or for any appointive county position. Any discussion? Again, I just get concerned about, um, not about intent, but about um, the, how understandable, you know, a document is gonna end up being. I mean, for most people, you know, I mean, I'm a layman, and, and so, uh, but I've been in, in legislative bodies. Um, candidate, you know, uh, Generally, people think of that uh, as a, you know, as someone who is a, a you know running for a public office, and so for it to be in the same sentence uh, as defining someone who is an applicant for county employment, I find to be confusing. Right. Mr. Miller, I I share that concern and and. Uh, and I'm trying to follow the process as we're doing it, but but I just have to say that if that if I were trying to write something like this, I would I would start by trying to write in plain and simple English what what I want to prohibit and and uh, and what I want to do about it when actions happen that are in violation and and uh, and how I want to uh, monitor it and and so on and. And then after I've done that, I would, I would then try to uh, uh, convert it into the language that's uh, legally tight and well defined, so that it can uh, can stand up under the various legal procedures that are required. And, and uh, I, I just hope that doing it in the fashion that we're doing it, that that, that we can get there. You know, so I'm going to continue to be patient. But I express that concern for what it's worth. I think we might have more trouble down the line if we try to take this to the next step. Okay, very good. Okay, well, with that said, then we will, I will um, move off the word candidate. We, we are almost, I know this has been an, an arduous process. But we are, we are too, not too far from completing that.
let, let's just move on to the next, next definition and then we'll come back. Um, we're, we're, like I said, we're not that far from, from moving through this process. And I appreciate the patience of the committee and this is a, maybe a, a different approach than has traditionally been afforded, but I feel that this will provide us with a head start as we start defining some policies, especially when we're defining policies for multiple documents and trying to incorporate them into one. Can I, for, for, for my notes, can, what did we decide on the word candidate? Uh, we, we didn't, we'll, okay. skip, we'll skip over okay. it and we'll come back and, yeah, that one we'll, we'll come there. back and we'll see oh. it's, a, it's applicable definition as, as the uh, policy may mandate. We'll move on to the word complaint, or complaint, and I'm sorry, a person who submits, a, and I'm working off the tag document, a person who submits a complaint of ethical misconduct to the county ethics board. Um, I, the complaint is, is listed in both documents. One complaint, the, the definition of the Greenspan says complaint means the person who has filed a written complaint signed and swore alleging a violation of the ethical ordinance. If we, they're, 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 they're somewhat synonymous with the exception of the ethics board, which we recognize right now we're um, gonna, de gonna debate the, uh, the merits of the ethics board. In its purest definition, do we wish to have the complaint and I mean a person who has filed a written complaint as the definition itself? Mr. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, uh, the point that I would bring up is that uh, I think at least it, as envisioned in the uh, in the transition document, that a written and sworn statement would not always be required. There, there would, there. Would, for example, it, it envisions uh, it envisions a hotline, where uh, where if someone felt uh, sufficiently uncomfortable, they could do it do it anonymously. So. Uh, I think uh, I think the idea of uh, of having filed a complaint alleging a violation of the ethics ordinance, as as in the Greenspan document, is is on target. But it should not specifically say that it has to be a written sworn statement. So the definition then would be a, a person who has filed a complaint. And leave it at that. Complainant means the person who has filed a, a complaint alleging a violation of the ethics ordinance. Okay. Any further discussion? Mr. Nani, did you? Okay. And, and we'll discuss. I, I, I'm just. We'll discuss later when we get into the to the issues of filing a complaint. Um, some of the challenges that will arise from having a the, the accuser not knowing who his, his or her accused is and what that process might be, but at the same time provide protection from retaliation. You run into significant issues when you have nobody stands before you as the, your accuser. Uh, conflicts of. Uh, Moving down, uh, conflicts of interest. I'm on the. Uh, I'm on page 12. A situation in which two interests collide, preventing impartial decision making. Any any discussion on that? Uh, I'm sorry. There's another definition of conflict of interest in the Greenspan document. Conflict of interest means not only a personal interest, as defined in this ordinance, but also a professional or non um, pecuniary interest, such as such as arises when. The county director of laws precluding from representing one public public employee. I'll substitute the word servant because the county's director of laws pre-existing attorney-client relationship with another public servant. So that definition gives an example, but 
So two, two definitions of conflict of interest. Once again, a situation in which two interests collide, preventing impartial decision making. The other is not only a personal interest, but also a professional interest, uh, period. Any, anyone really have an issue with either one or preference? No, no my, my question is just more fundamental. I'm, I'm assuming that you're, you're not using the, the, from your, from the Greenspan document, you're not suggesting that, um, that we're going to have as language in our document an example. No, we're not. Okay. No, we're not. Thank you. Sorry. Is, is there is there a preference to which definition? Straightforward, yeah. A situation, well, a situation in which two interests collide, preventing impartial decision making. That, that's that's fundamentally it. I would I would not have, Mr. Miller. I would somewhat merge the two by saying uh, a situation in which two interests collide preventing impartial decision making or maybe do it earlier a situation which may be uh, which may be uh, monetary, professional, or non-pecuniary, in which two interests com collide, preventing impartial decision-making. Uh, uh, read that back, Mr. Nani. <laughs> okay. Mr. Chairman, to Mr. Nani. A situation which may be personal, professional, or non-pecuniary, or better yet, a, a situation which may be monetary, professional, or non-pecuniary in which two interests collide, preventing impartial decision-making. Get back, please. A situation which may be monetary, professional, or non-procuinary, in which two interests collide, preventing impartial decision-making. Correct. Any discussion? That's the definition. Contract, did, did we, did we not address contract earlier? We touched on We did, okay, so we'll skip on contract. Contractor, contractor. We did not de not define that. A person or business, including but not limited to service providers, vendors, consultants, and the subcontractors that provide goods and services to the county under terms specified in a binding official approved agreement. Any discussion? Hearing none, that definition will, will prevail. Uh, moving back over to, well, we'll do covered person. Covered persons. In the tag definition, all elected or and appointed county officials and employees. This includes council members and staff, the prosecuting attorney and staff, and all county appointed members and employees of paid and volunteer boards and commissions or their agencies. Sections of the code may apply to contractors and lobbyists. I, the, the one issue I see here is we, we cannot include the prosecuting attorney in that definition since they do not will not conform or comply, and we cannot pass an ethics ordinance on their behalf, correct? Uh, yeah. I, I'm not an attorney, but it's interesting the discussion that took place relative to the Metro Board earlier um, and the prosecuting attorney's office. I mean, I think that was when you look at the, the 
language in the Ohio Revised Code relative to, I know that we, we make appointments to that board, but we also approve the budgets for both the Metro Board, Metro Hospital, and the prosecuting attorney. So well, that might be something that you, I don't, I don't know, it's confusing. It's related to the earlier discussion. Um, it just, you have authority over other entities, but where, what, what is that authority, I guess, is part of the question. Mr. Miller. Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the, uh, not only are, are the people on the, in the prosecuting attorney's office better attorneys than I am. I am not even an attorney at all. But, uh, but from my perspective, the, uh, the prosecuting attorney is covered under the charter. And the fact that, uh, that the charter calls for that person to be elected rather than appointed, I don't think uh, uh, means that, that, nothing that nothing that's done under the auspices of, of, of the charter county government can apply to them. I, I, my opinion is that uh, that we're within our powers to uh, uh, create an ethics law that it, that includes the uh, the uh, the prosecuting attorney as one of the uh, offices that's created by and, and covered under the charter. Mr. Brady, um, I think this is going to be you know one of those areas of uh, in interest and debate. Um, I don't disagree with Councilman Miller's interpretation. I think that the inevitable, inevitably this, this is going to lead toward a process that's gonna spill over into the Charter Review Commission's work uh, where there will be differences in terms of how uh, different entities like the prosecutor's office uh, define the charter. Yeah, I, I, I would agree, um, especially- So I'm saying I'm not sure how you know, how far, without disagreeing with Councilman Miller, I'm not quite sure how far we can go, although I'm not unwilling to, you know, to uh, push the envelope. I think that, that probably, are, there, are, there are probably going to be some disagreements uh, over, uh, over, you know, the definition of the charter. Well, and, and I would agree, and I would, I would leave the, for the time being, leave prosecuting attorney and staff in, um, however, as we know, and we talked about this, the political activities of, of, of uh, county employees, uh, the, the ability for us to provide an ethics ordinance that will cover the prosecutor's office to, for them to comply with the same ordinances as everyone else, it's an interesting silo issue to determine can we do that. I would be inclined to leave it in and let the Ohio Ethics Commission or our attorneys take it out. Is, is, is my recommendation because if we leave it out and we find out that our ethics does apply to the prosecuting attorney, we may, we may miss something. My recommendation would be to, to adopt, adopt the covered persons as, as read. Mr. Chair, Mr. Miller. I'm with the chair. So is there a, agreement to uh, adopt the covered persons definition? Yes. No opposition. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna to have to excuse myself. Very good, thank you. Thank you for serving today. Um, conflict of interest. We still have quorum, we're still, and we're gonna we're gonna move quick quickly through this. Um, because it's important that we, we get this taken care of today. Some of this we've already covered. Working, working off the transition advisory group document. We'll just we'll just continue on. Um, disclose the the uh, definition of 
day, a calendar day, unless otherwise noted. Any questions with that? I'm not sure the how it's applicable yet within the document, but yeah. And any any discussion on the definition of day as being a calendar day, unless whether if we can handle that one. Uh, disclosure of the reporting of financial, personal, or business connections, gifts, activities, campaign contributions, or political or potential conflicts of interest will be the definition of disclosure. No one, no, no issue there. Moving on. Well, I'll, I'll just, we'll just continue this and I'll look and see if there's a reference. That way we don't keep going back and forth. We can, I think we can quickly move through this. Uh, due process is a course of legal form proceeding carried out regularly with established rules and principles, a fundamental right of any covered person accused of any violation of the ethics code. Any discussion? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm working solely now off the TAG document. Family members we've already taken care of. Finding the official decision reached by the County Ethics Board uh, after thorough investigation or a formal hearing. Once again, we've, we don't need to rehash the, the Ethics Board discussion. We'll adopt this and modify it as needed. Um, gift, we've already, I believe we've already covered gift did, uh, last week, did we not? Maybe we didn't. I know we covered honorarium. Mr. Nani, did we cover gift? Do you recall? The, de the definition here? Okay. Okay. We we have two two def two definitions of gift. Uh, anything of value, including but not limited to money, goods, future employment, uh, interest in realty, payments, loans, and services. The the referral to honorarium, which we, we which we I know we covered last uh, on Tuesday. The other definition of gift is any benefit or anything or act of monetary value which is conveyed to or, perf or performed for the benefit of a public servant. Uh, obviously that definition is different. Or a partner in interest including any advance award, contract, contribution, deposit, employment, favor, forbearance, gift, gratuity, honorarium, loan payment, service, subscription, or the promise that any of these things or acts of value will be conveyed in the future. If such thing or act a value is con is conferred or performed without the lawful exchange of consideration, which is at least equal in value of the thing or act conferred or performed. So we have two definitions. Um, one is much more encompassing than the other. It also refers anything, both refer to a, uh, in the definitions of anything of value, which we've already defined. For the sake of brevity, maybe the, the transition advisory group definition, since it refers to anything of value, would convey the same definition of gift. If there's uh, Mr. Miller, what do you think? I like the Greenspan definition, except to substitute at the end. change it to without the lawful exchange of consideration which is commensurate in value to the thing or act conferred or performed. You know, if, 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 uh, if you get something at a five or 10 percent discount, well, it's, uh, it's probably not a gift. Okay. The, the way it's written, it has to be at least equal in value. It, okay. You know, it, we should say it, it, uh, it's commensurate. It, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in the same, okay. same area. I understand. Mr. Nani, do you understand? I do not. Okay. okay. I'm page four. I got it. Okay. What, Mr. Miller, the last sentence, after 
um, lawful exchange of consideration, which is, I, as I wrote it down, which is commensurate in value. Correct? Is that definition ag agreeable? Okay. Next item, uh, moving down. Interest, I believe we've already covered. Lawful disclosure, um, once again on the TAG document. Lawful disclosure is public divulgence of any county matter not legally required to be kept confidential because of personal, of personal privacy, ongoing litigation, or, or property negotiations. Any uh, Page 13, lawful disclosure. No discussion, we'll, we'll adopt that definition. Where was gratuity, did we, what was the uh, decision on that? I'm sorry, I, I had marked through gratuity in error. Sorry? I would marked through it in error, we did not, we did not cover it. Going back to gratuity, supplementary compensation such as a tip to an official or employee for, a tip is in quotes, um, to an employee, to an official or employee for having granted a favor of or service to the donor. In that definition, might we want to add a tip or anything of value or, or further define or, or uh, no? Again, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not an attorney and I, and I feel a little, um, uh, Given the fact that we have no attorneys mm -hmm. in the room, um, uh, some I'm, I'm uncertain about you know the, the language here, and mm -hmm. I mean, uh, uh, I'm, I'm you know I'm familiar with the word tip, but I've never seen it in a in okay. a document um, uh, such as the one we're putting together, and I'm I, I'm okay. Why don't we do this as we did with the previous yeah, definition? We'll I understand what it means, right. but I, I just don't understand if that's the way we would write a document like this. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we, as we did in the previous item, we'll, we'll come back to it later should the need arise, being mindful that we know where to find that word should we need it. Um, lawful, uh, we were back on lawful disclosure. Do we move past that one? Okay, I'm assuming we did. Yeah. Uh, Lobbyist, and obviously this definition, if it's in conflict with the state ethics law, the, the Ohio Ethics Commission will let us know. An individual wholly or partly compensated for direct private communication with county policy making officials or their staffs with the purpose of influencing the expenditure of funds and the awarding of a contract or other financial arrangement or from making direct private contact with the same to promote, advocate, or oppose the passage modification defeat approval or veto of any legislation or policy. Mr. Miller. I like this definition except to, de to delete the word private in the two, two places where it occurs. You could pay mm -hmm. a lobbyist to, uh, to come to the public comment session at, at every council and every committee meeting and, and and advocate for this or that, and, and if uh, and if uh, if you're paying them to do it, and and, and they're they're advocating, it's mm -hmm. still lobbying. Uh, I don't think lobbying need, needs to be in private. I, I would agree with that, Mr. Brady. Okay, very good. Uh, uh, moving moving along, nepotism, a practice of hiring or appointing family members to positions, or of awarding other favors to same. Uh, we have we have a definition for family members. Instead of family members, we're using full family was the definition. So I would make the recommendation that we change family members to full fam uh, change family to or include the word full family. Remove the word members. The practice of hiring or appointing full family. I guess we'd leave members to positions or awarding other uh, other favors to same. Any discussion? Nominating authority. 
leader of a nonprofit entity invited to provide suggested nominees to the county executive for appointment to the county ethics board. Once again, I would just recommend that we adopt that as is and see how we discuss the further future discussions of the ethics board proceed. Official, we don't have to discuss official, we had public official earlier. Patronage, the practice of hiring or appointing political allies in a business or governmental position or governmental or to, uh, to governmental positions. Any discussion closely related to nepotism but dealing with non-family members? Okay, very good. That'll move, move along. Personal gain, any benefit? Didn't we do a personal gain? Or something, something to the effect? Personal benefit, okay. Joe, does that closely rely ally with personal gain? I would think so. Okay. okay. All right, we'll, we'll move on. Prohibited source, a party that gives or promises an unlawful gift to any covered person, just specifically a party doing or seeking to do business with, regulated by, or interested in matters before the county, its department, agency, boards, or commissions, including any lobbyist or contractor. I guess the operative word here would be unlawful gift. Any discussion? Protected disclosure, rightful public divulgence of a county matter covered by the whistleblower provision of this code. There's a, just as a sidebar, 124.341 discusses uh, from, the, from the Ohio Revised Code, violations or misuse of whistleblower protection. When we get to that section, We'll, we'll discuss some of, these, some of these terms and definitions. For the sake of today, um, I would be inclined to adopt that uh, definition, at least provide us some guidelines as we move forward in discussing the whistle, whistleblower uh, protection. Any discussion? So hearing none. Recusal, to, recusal and to recuse the act of removing oneself from decision making in matters where one has a conflict of interest. I don't have any issues with this, Joe. The only thing I would add is conflict of interest. We put in quotes since we denoted that that was one of our one of our definitions. Respondent, a person accused of ethical misconduct in a complaint submitted to the county board of Eth uh, the county ethics board. I move to adopt that, understanding the provision of the ethics board. Secondary employment. Um, secondary employment is also defined. By the county's the county's code of ethics as a secondary employment provision, a moonlighting provision. I, I don't know. I, I don't have the county's code of ethics in front of me, but I'd recommend that we adopt that definition because mm -hmm. it's already in a document that's been approved and used throughout. I don't know if they v vary much differently. That, that's fine. I'm, I'm just saying there is a, a local amendment to, or a local ordinance related to secondary employment that the county already has adopted, that we've adopted. Very good. Uh, settlement, mutual agreement between a complaint and a respondent and the county ethics board in which the complaint agrees to dismiss the complaint and the respondent agrees not to pursue his or her defense and to accept a penalty mediated with the ethics board. Once again, Pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll address it on the ethics board provision. To waive, to give up voluntary legal right to which one is entitled. It's a pretty legal standard definition. Whistleblower person who reports possible crimes or violations to the ethics uh, of this ethics code. Any issues there? No issues there. Okay. We're almost done. I was only off by an hour, I'm sorry. Now just pulling straight off this, this Greenspan document just to see if there are any gaps. Um, and Joe, I may need your help on these. Decision maker, did we discuss deci decision maker? Just in general. Oh, no, we 
then we're on green, the Greenspan dock. We're done with the Transition Advisory Group. We're done with the Board of uh, the Ohio Ethics Commission. So now we're just focused on anything that might we might have missed um, in the uh, in the Greenspan document, page oh, three. This. Oh. Yes. Let me let me make a recommendation here. I, 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 I see I see the pain of going through this line by line, word by word. And I, I I respect your indulgence, your indulging me in the opportunity to go through this process in this fashion. I still do believe this will be the best fashion to go through and create this ethics ordinance. If if the members of the committee will allow me to work independently from this point forward from, with Mr. Nani to review these definitions submit them to you for approval and that way we can expedite the process and not consume more more time than is necessary what i would what i would recommend is and, and suggest is that from decision maker down that the board review those definitions and if you have a an in a, a uh, any recommendations for change we will present them at our next meeting very briefly um, in discussion, but I think it's important now. We've been here almost three hours today and, and uh, three hours on uh, Tuesday that we move forward to the next part of the process, which is actually establishing the policy. Is Are my colleagues in agreement with giving the chair the liberty to, to pursue? Mr. Chairman, I am also in agreement. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Mr. Nani. We have some work to do. All right, with that being said, then what, what I would like to do is set the next meeting for Tuesday at 1 p.m. Mr. Miller. We have the problem of the job summit, which I think it is important that, uh, that we attend. Look at the calendar. It's a good point, and I tend to be uh, at the job summit as well. Do um, I wasn't I wasn't um, I wasn't sure exactly what the you know what was going to go on from um, noon to five o'clock. I, I at least haven't received, maybe somebody else has, more detailed information on this four-hour job summit. I'm not sure my attendance is necessary for four hours mm -hmm. of it. Um, but um, uh, so, you know, with that said, um, but then we're going to run into eventually the work session uh, before, the, before the council meeting, correct? Correct. We have a work session at four. Council at six. Well, Mr. Chairman, you're going to have to determine how much time you want to allot for your next meeting, I suppose. Well, the next meeting is where we start getting into some ni nice discussion. And it, it's hard for me to dictate exactly how long some of that discussion is going to take place. confirmation hearings on Thursday of next week just looking at the calendar next week If we were if we were to meet the job summits from twelve to twelve to five, 
I'd hate to, I'd hate to skip a week. It throws us off, and we've got a deadline of March 22nd. Looking at Wednesday, we can tentatively schedule. I, I hate to go on Wednesday. It's, there are other committee meetings, I believe, on Wednesday. I may have to go to Columbus on Wednesday. That, and, and that's why I'm curious if we meet Tuesday at, at I know the job summit, but if we met at 2 o'clock, I don't know how much our, our participation is going to be necessary. And I'm on that economic development committee, I think. On, I have a personal conflict at 9 o'clock. Wednesday. L let me let me check here real quick. We can do we can do two, we can do Monday mon Monday at two o'clock. The only reason I, I I have a speaking engagement at, in Independence at, at, at noon. Uh, on Monday. Yeah. Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? Oh, okay. Okay. I'm in Independence. Yeah, I, what, I, what I'll do is I'll put together an, a, a, an agenda as to the sections of the ethics ordinance that, that we will be addressing. And I may seek your input in that so that we do it expeditiously. There, there are multiples. There are four primary, or five primary actually, sections of the ethics ordinance that we need to address. So we will... Um, I'll sit down and come up with a detailed plan, and we'll try to be more, more um, judicious with our time as we go through that. I just, I, I, I just felt this was important to go through this first. In hindsight, I might have taken it, might take a different tact, maybe more of the tact we're ending with today. Um, but where we are now, and what we're trying to do, we'll, we'll go through the uh, ordinance. I'll put together an agenda and get it out to, to everyone. I wrote up a broad outline for an ethics law, just in case it's of any use to you. This covers fundamentally the, the multiple sections we were talking about. Okay, great. Okay, great. All right, so uh, Monday at 2 o'clock. Any any uh, 